Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Seattle-born actress Frances Farmer, a rising star in the 1930s, is remembered today more for her unfortunate life story than for her once promising career. Frances Farmer has been subject to dramatic fictionalization, but the truth of her life is much darker. Was Frances Farmer's insanity a misdiagnosis? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Talented and beautiful, Farmer was also willful, troubled and self-destructive. After a period of increasingly erratic behaviour, she was declared legally insane and institutionalised in 1944. Released in 1950, she spent the rest of her life in relative obscurity. Since her death in 1970, however, she has become something of a cult figure, the subject of three books, three movies, the best known of which is the 1982 film Francis, starring Jessica Lange, several off-Broadway plays, scores of magazine articles, and a song, Francis Farmer Will Have Her Revenge on Seattle, by Kurt Cobain, which includes this line, She'll come back as fire to burn all the liars and leave a blanket of ash on the ground. The standard version of the Francis Farmer story goes like this. An idealistic young actress challenges the hypocrisy of her world and becomes the victim of a spiteful mother, a vengeful Hollywood and a cabal of callous and arrogant psychiatrists. Together they force her into a state mental hospital where she is brutalised by electric shock and other barbaric treatments, abused by orderlies, fellow inmates and soldiers from a nearby army base, and eventually lobotomized. Her rebellious spirit finally shattered, she leaves the institution an atomized half-woman, only a shadow of the vibrant artist she had once been. Whatever the true story, it has been eclipsed by the mythology. With the medical records closed and all the principal players long dead, Little can be said with certainty about what really happened to Frances Farmer. Still, two things seem clear. The behaviour that landed her in an insane asylum half a century ago would scarcely raise an eyebrow today, and yet had she not been institutionalised, she might well have been long forgotten. Instead, decades after her death, the self-described bad girl of West Seattle High has taken on a larger-than-life role as the star of a cautionary fable. This video is at last attempting to give Frances Farmer a little compassionate understanding. Not many people made that attempt during her lifetime. She was a different kind of woman, maybe too bold for the 40s when all it took to be an actress was beauty and obedience. Frances Farmer dared to be stubborn and they called her hysterical. She dared to have a voice and ask for more interesting roles and they called her naive. When she wanted to escape from that world it was already too late. That was when they started to call her crazy. Today, not many people probably recognise the name Frances Farmer anymore. She's yet another woman lost in the haze of time. Behind that dusty curtain where we stashed the interesting stories for another time, some of which are a muffled cry for help that we need to listen to even now. But in the world of psychiatry, the actress's name is very well known. There are a few reasons for this. One of the main ones, the psychological treatments they subjected this woman to over the years reflect a dark, terrible time in psychiatry, one where women strangely tended to be the most direct victims. Be that as it may, as it always is with these complex cases, there's something we can't leave out. Her upbringing and the historical context are very important. Born on September 19, 1913, Frances Eleanor Farmer, was the third child of Lillian Van Ornum and Ernest Melvin Farmer. Her father, a son of a Minnesota Circuit County judge, was a lawyer who settled in Seattle in 1900. Lillian, a member of a pioneer family from Roseburg, Oregon, ran the boarding house where Ernest lived. She was recently divorced with a young child. The couple married in 1906, bought a house on Capitol Hill, and together had a son, Wesley, and a daughter, Edith, before Francis was born. By most accounts, Ernest Farmer was a kind but ineffectual man. Lillian, in contrast, was strong-minded, outspoken and ambitious. She made national news during World War I by crossing a Rhode Island Red, a white leghorn 
and an Andalusian blue to obtain a red, white and blue chicken, which she thought should replace the eagle as the national emblem. After the war, she campaigned against Seattle's commercial bakeries, which she claimed sold nutritionally inferior products. She also supported feminist causes and later became a fervent anti-communist. Francis described her as a determined, hard-willed woman who did little in moderation. Francis herself inherited some of these characteristics, and the conflicts between the two women eventually escalated to a level that neither seemed able to control. Her domineering mother, a stern super-patriot, constantly frustrated Farmer by ranting against her idealistic career goals and political beliefs. The Communist Party used the young actress in a much ballyhooed attempt to gain sympathy for its cause in mid-thirties Moscow. The Paramount studio chiefs asked her to grind out one frothy feature after another, disregarding her consuming thirst for artistic growth. In the early 1920s, the family moved to a modest bungalow in West Seattle. Ernest Farmer's law practice had faltered. As the family's fortunes declined, Farmer's relationship with his wife deteriorated. He moved out of the house when Francis was a teenager, returning only for regular weekend visits. Eventually the couple divorced. Francis grew up a somewhat lonely, bookish child. She also demonstrated precocious talents for performing, gifts her mother encouraged with voice and piano lessons. She made her stage debut at age 14, appearing with her older sister in a West Seattle Congregational Church operetta titled The Pirate's Daughter. The young girl was already demonstrating some of the stage presence that would make her a star. I mentioned that Frances was too bold of a woman for her time. She was like that because her mother started her off early giving her advice teaching her how to give her opinion and to always question things. By the time she was a teenager, she'd managed to appear in local Seattle newspapers. She did it by giving powerful speeches about women believing in God or not, based on Nietzsche's writing. Later, her mother signed her up for theatre classes with one very specific goal in mind. It was related to satisfying a personal desire that she never achieved in her own youth. She had wanted to become famous in the movies. Frances got famous in college, still keeping up one of her favourite activities, writing critical articles about the day's society. By 1935, Frances Farmer had already been in a few movies. She'd also accomplished her main objective, to get a degree in journalism. But before she started to go in that direction, her mother convinced her otherwise. She told her to temporarily put her professional career on hold and focus on the world of stage. Frances agreed, and her agent got her an audition with Paramount Pictures. The screen test couldn't have been easier. She had to wear a pretty dress, sit down, and look at the camera. Frances Farmer had a classic beauty that occasionally showed insolence and bold seductiveness. That was more than enough for the movie industry. They offered her a seven-year contract. All she had to do was obey, learn script, and go to executives' parties every once in a while and to keep quiet about whatever might happen at those gatherings. Frances rebelled against the world. She hated the roles they gave her where she played the naive woman. She hated the press, and above all, she hated having to follow another script in her life. One where everything had to be wrapped in glamour and elegant lies. But she gave in. She gave in because her mother and agents convinced her. She even married an actor to raise her profile as an up-and-coming star. The marriage was not a happy one, and the couple separated a year later. I did not go into the union with any dewy-eyed hopes or illusions, Farmer wrote, and in my mind I was still Francis Farmer, not Mrs. William Anderson, and certainly not Mrs. Leif Erickson. She was grateful for what seemed a generous salary, a hundred dollars a week to start, but she also made it clear that she regarded filmmaking as only a stepping stone to the legitimate theatre. Still, she dutifully submitted to most of the demands made of her. She underwent various makeovers, including one that involved having her eyebrows shaved off, working with voice movement and acting coaches, and spent hours posing for publicity photos, including the bathing suit shots and other leg art that the studio insisted on. However, she refused to change her name, and she rarely dressed in the glamorous style expected of a starlet. 
By the end of the year, she had made four movies, steadily moving from small parts to larger roles. The last of these was what many critics regard as her best film, Come and Get It. Photoplay magazine called her performance sensationally brilliant. Hawke said at the time and in his later years that she was the best actress he had ever worked with. Gossip columnist Luella Parsons predicted that she would be the next Greta Garbo. With the onset of fame, Farmer developed a reputation for being temperamental and difficult to work with. She became more openly contemptuous of Hollywood. It's a nut house, she told one interviewer, and of the people who lived and worked there. Still, she remained in demand, making three movies in the first six months of 1937. None of them, however, brought her the acclaim of Come and Get It. Frustrated with Hollywood and still hoping to realise her dreams of becoming a success on stage, she convinced Paramount to give her a leave from her contract in order to appear in two summer stock productions on the East Coast. Then in September, Harold Clerman, director of the group theatre, asked her to join that legendary ensemble as the female lead in Clifford Odette's play Golden Boy. At age 24, Farmer had accomplished everything she had set out to do when she left Seattle, and yet at the same time there were undercurrents of strain. Shortly after beginning work on Golden Boy, she had fallen in love with Odette's. Their tempestuous, emotionally devastating affair ended abruptly when Odette sent her a note that read, my wife returns from Europe today, and I feel it best for us never to see each other again. She began to drink heavily. Then in 1938 she was sued by the agent who had arranged her screen test with Paramount. He claimed she owed him $75,000 in manager's fees. She won the court battle with the help of noted New York lawyer Louis Neiser, but it was a further complication in a life that was beginning to unravel. Chastened, Farmer returned to Hollywood, but she never regained her momentum. The decline in Frances Farmer's career started early on. She refused to shoot certain scenes. She rejected scripts and didn't comply with the contract she signed with her agents. She liked to drive around at night to escape from it all, including herself. Frances pressed down the accelerator in an impossible escape that often ended badly. She was well known by the Santa Monica police, for getting a great deal of reckless and drunk driving tickets. But everything got complicated when she punched one of the Hollywood executives. After that she tried to run away again, although not very far away. The police followed her, with screams, kicks and pointless attempts to get free of those shadows of authority falling all on top of her, they reached an agreement. They would put her in a psychiatric hospital to calm down her rebelliousness, her personality, the doctors diagnosed her as a paranoid schizophrenic. They treated her with their classic electroshock therapy as well as insulin shock therapy, or the SACAL cure. After a few months there, they let her out. Then she decided to completely break away from her life as an actress, to forever get away from that oppressive, degrading world. But Lillian Farmer, Frances's mother, felt that her daughter still wasn't cured. She thought Frances wasn't in her right mind. So, with the help of the Hollywood executives, they managed to declare her mentally unfit. That allowed them to toss her back into a psychiatric ward. Isolated and bitter, she felt herself beginning to slip away. She began to work on her memoirs, hoping that she might be able to purge herself through self-examination. She was also drinking heavily and becoming increasingly dependent on amphetamines. A woman who was worried constantly about her weight at the time, the drug was widely available and often recommended by doctors as an appetite suppressant. Not until the 1970s was it discovered that amphetamines are highly addictive, have unpredictable side effects and, taken in sufficient quantities, can produce symptoms similar to those of schizophrenia. Whether she was mentally ill or simply suffering the effects of alcohol and drug abuse may never be known. In any case, her downward spiral accelerated on October 19, 1942, when a policeman in Santa Monica stopped her for driving with her bright headlights on in a wartime dim-out zone. She got into an altercation with the officer, reportedly telling him, you bore me, and was arrested on charges of drunken driving, driving without a license and failure to obey dim-out restrictions. She was fined $250 and sentenced, 
to 180 days in jail, suspended. Frances Farmer was checked into a hospital in Stylacoom, Washington. The five years she spent there are the ones her sister would later give voice to through her book. They did even worse things to her than just the awful psychiatric treatments. Ultimately, as one of the nurses in the hospital later testified, they performed an unapproved lobotomy on Frances Farmer. The goal? To calm down her personality, her bad character, her hysterical nature. After five years of being locked up, abuse and trauma, she'd never be the same again. She appeared in an occasional interview, play or TV series. On TV, her mere presence generated curiosity and a huge audience, but she really wasn't there anymore. She'd lost her will, her character was muted, her true beauty, what made up the true Francis Farmer, had been stolen, surgically removed. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Frances Farmer was a woman raised to have a voice and be famous, but she was not the only one who had a problem with repressive parents. It might interest you, how was Vivian Vance reminded she is going to hell every day?